I began to realize that the history of the bison and the history of my family are very interconnected. So I thought you might hear, like to hear some stories today about where those connections appear. Let's take a moment to imagine what the Bow Valley was like in the mid-1800s when my ancestors came west from Ontario. My grandfather, James Brewster, often spoke of his experiences in hauling freight by wagon from Winnipeg to Edmonton. It was a hard trip. He often spoke about the experiences he had and I remember tell him telling me about the first impressions of the great lone land that this is known of. Just picture it. There was not a bridge or a road between Edmonton or between the Rockies and Winnipeg. And so it was a hard trip. They often had to take their, their, their freight wagons apart and float them across streams and bring the horses on behind. And it, it was a, quite a job. And of course, the Red River cart was designed for that because you could actually repair it en route. They used uh, entirely wood and uh, buffalo sinew, which is called Shaganafi, to do that. He talked too about the tall grass as high as a horse's withers which is just the shoulder of the, ho of the uh, horse, and about the myriad of flowers all over the prairies. The only sign of civilization were the Hudson Bay ports and trading posts linked together by Indian trails. Huge herds of buffalo roamed, and they were the chief source of food and clothing for these early travelers, as well as for the First Nations people. My grandfather loved the freedom and openness of the country and decided to settle in the Bow Valley, ranching and raising horses. When the railway construction reached the mountain, he had a concession in the Sundance Valley, which we all know is just over this range, uh, for lovely for the ties, for the construction of the rails. And uh, it was pretty quiet in those days, but. Within a few years, he brought his three brothers from Ontario to Banff. They stayed to play an important part in the development of this area. Johnny Brewster, the oldest, established a dairy. His sons, Jim and Bill, Jim was named for his uncle, he started, started to work quite early. Their first jobs, at age eight and 10, were to guide guests from the Grand Springs to their favorite fishing holes. And this was the beginning of the Brewster Transport Company, which now operates a variety of tourist services in Banff and is one of Banff's major employers. William Brewster built the first iron bridge on the Bull River in Banff when the pontoon bridge was swept away in the flood. He also built the first bathhouse at the Cape and Basin. The third brother, George, spent his life exploring and prospecting and training wild horses in the Brazil area. Both he and Jim transported military supplies in the Rio Rebellion in 1885. Let's step back now in time to the early 1870s. This story begins with the arrival of the Reverend George McDougall and his family, who established a Methodist mission at Morley in 1873, 10 years before the railway, and prior to the establishment of Fort Calgary and the arrival of the Northwest Mounted Police. Many of you have seen the, the white church they built in 1875, which is on the number one highway, 1A, I'm sorry, 1A highway near Morley, between here and Calgary. Unlike most missions, 
the McDougalls were invited by the Stony people to establish a mission there. As they were, the Stonies were still practicing uh, singing hymns and acknowledging Sunday right, uh, taught to them by the Reverend Rondo in 1842. And as many of you know, the Rondo Mountain is named for that first man. And that was the previous contact with the Christian faith. The McDougalls came as a family, and their daily life was closely connected with the Stonies. The men hunted with the Stonies. The children played and went to school with their children. The wives worked together in preparing food and other chores with the nearest doctor over 100 miles away. They learned from the natives about the traditional healing herbs and natural medicines. A village grew up around the mission called Morivelle. It was the first community in southern Alberta. Uh, just a lot of people think about the residential school problems in the uh, mission uh, work, but actually the the uh, the residential school legislation was just passed in 1918, which is a long time after the McDougalls had their mission. My grandmother, as a young woman, came to Morley with her family in 1880 to help at the mission. They came west from Ontario and uh, up the Missouri River by paddle boat. I think they called them paddle steamer, paddle wheelers. And uh, when they, everything went well until they got up around uh, Fort Benton in Montana. And at that point, a huge herd of buffalo were crossing the river. And they had to wait several hours till the last buffalo passed. And by that time, the, the buffalo had taken so much water out of the river with their shaggy coats that they had to wait again till the mighty Missouri filled with water till the, the boat was navigable again. So it was quite an experience. And this painting by Charlie Russell depicts it exactly. And I suspect that he was on the same trip with uh, my grandmother. Mary Jane, as my grandmother was called, um, met my grandfather, James Brewster, Brinjim Brewster, at Morley, and they were married in 1887 at the little white church there. They never let, well, left the West they loved. Later, Jim, Jim developed many real estate interests in the province, including a hotel and a homestead east of Golden, Alberta. He was loved and respected by all who knew him. So here we are in the Luxon Garden. There's still another story about Buffalo. Norman Luxon was raised in Winnipeg. As a young man, his adventurous spirit brought him to Calgary to work for the Herald newspaper. On a visit to Victoria, he met an old lady sailor, Captain Voss, who had been at sea since he was nine years old. He was determined to prove he could sail around the world in a canoe. This sounded to Norman like a great adventure. He and Captain Voss found an old hide canoe made of one cedar log, bought it and rigged it with sails in a small cabin, and started on their trip from Victoria in 1901. There's a wonderful book about uh, his adventures. And uh, it was quite, quite a, a journey because uh, they had very little space. Only one at a time could be off the deck. And uh, they had very limited food and supplies. And of course, no planes to drop them more supplies. So they were out there all by themselves on the Pacific. All went well until they... I'm sorry. until they got to Fiji, when Norman was swept off the ship. 
and suffered curious, uh, serious abrasions from the coral reefs. He had to leave the ship and return to Canada. He came to BAMP to recover. At that time, the, the sulfur water was meant to clear heal almost every ill. Norman saw business opportunities in BAMP and decided to stay here. He bought the Craig Can Canyon newspaper, built a hotel, and began to develop active trade with the Stony Indians. At Marley, he met Georgina McDougall. They married and moved to this house, which was their home for the rest of their lives. Where do bison come into this story? Well, nearly all plains bisons at this point were gone from the area by the 1880s. Norman heard that a large herd of buffalo would be sold in Montana. And being the adventurer he was, he decided to get involved. With the support of Parks Canada, an arrangement was made to purchase the herd and bring it to Canada. This was easier said than done, but between 96 and 1909, over 700 bison were rounded up, loaded in boxcars, and shipped to Canada. It's a great story and it's told in Norman's own words in a book that his daughter Ellen wrote called Banff, Canada's First National Park, which is available at the White Museum, and I'd encourage you to read that. The greater part of the herd were unloaded at Alcala Park near Edmonton, but several came to a paddock in Banff where tourists could view these magnificent animals. In the 1980s, the bison were moved to free up a large area of montane grassland for other animals. <laughs> Since then, Parks Canada has been studying bison release, and now we're closer than ever to seeing this happen and to be able to observe this iconic beast roaming free once again in this area. Bison belong. To close, there is here in the Luxton Garden a poignant reminder of the early history of the area. In the back corner of the, the Egyptian Garden, there is a small statue. It is in memory of Reverend George McDougall, the missionary, who died during a winter buffalo hunt in 1877. From what is believed to have been a heart attack, he was 57 years old and he had really given his life for his work. They felt he'd been separated from the hunting group and was heading back to camp. His body was found two weeks later near Nose Hill in Calgary. The statue depicts him in the clothes he was wearing when he died. George McDougall made a great contribution to the peaceful settlement of the West and he never faltered in his conviction that he was doing God's work. That conviction carried him through many hardships and trials. He will be long and lovingly remembered. Thank you for joining us today. Please enjoy the garden and the food and join me in thanking the Bites of Long crew Maria Marshall, Julius Minx, and Jolene Brewster for all their efforts in planning this day. I think they've done a terrific job. And watch for the website, Bison Belong, for updates on other events that we're planning in the Bow Valley. Enjoy. To learn more about bison and why they belong in Banff National Park, visit our website, bisonbelong.ca.